What is going on, guys? Hello and welcome to episode 67 of the Ford Drugs of Football Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Party, and today we're going to be recapping the Thanksgiving Day games before getting into the um, Week 12 slate of games. So, let's get right on into it. Alright, so, if you're on YouTube, as you can tell, don't have the camera on for this one. Um, out of town for Thanksgiving. I hope you guys all enjoyed your Thanksgiving. And yeah, we had three really good games actually on Thanksgiving that I was really happy that we actually got some entertaining football. Um, let's start it off with the Bills at the Lions. The Bills winning 28 to 25. I picked the Lions or the Bills to cover and win. The Lions did end up covering. And yeah, this game was just a lot closer than what I thought it would be. And did the Lions like really turn a corner or did the Bills take a step back? And honestly, I kind of think it's a bit of both. Right now, Josh Allen definitely is at 100%. He's got that UCL injury, missing on some throws, and he had yet another red zone turnover, which I also think is a bit of a mental thing. Um, But at the same time, he made some wild plays in this game once again. Like that throw to Diggs at the end of the game was just unreal. I think overall he'll be fine. Um, But it is definitely like he's not the best quarterback in the league anymore. I thought he was, but yeah, no, that's definitely still Patrick Mahomes. But their defense also isn't as good as it was earlier this year. Ed Oliver and Matt Milano had a great game, but missing Vaughn is a significant blow to their pass rush, which is already without Rousseau. And these backup cornerbacks can only play well for so long. Luckily, Trey White is returning this game, but um, he didn't play much. I would assume he's going to have to play a lot more next game. Like, Hopefully, he'll be out there the full game. Um, that should help the defense out a lot, but yeah, this definitely no longer feels like the number one D in the league anymore, but also credit to the lions on offense. Everyone minus their offensive line is coming back healthy. And that includes Jameson Williams, who looks like he's going to get a shot any week now. And this defense is really stepping up. John Kaminsky is starting to see more significant snaps. He started seeing that a few weeks ago and this week he really broke out, not getting a sack, but constantly getting pressure on Allen. And rookie six-rounder James Houston got home twice in his first career game. Then in the secondary, Jerry Jacobs is playing phenomenally. I think when healthy, they have four legit dudes back there. Like, obviously, Jerry Jacobs just shouted him out. Uh, Jeff Okuda, former number three overall pick, has been playing really good this year. Kirby Joseph, a third-round pick this year, has been great. And then Tracy Walker's been there for a minute. He's been their reliable safety, been out since the beginning of the year. But when he's in there, those are four legit guys. They get, need one more guy to fill in that slot position consistently. And this is a really good secondary, I think. So while this loss definitely does suck, the Lions are heading in the right direction. All right, then we have the Giants at the Cowboys. Uh, Giants with the nasty backdoor cover, twenty-eight to twenty. Uh, picked the Cowboys to cover and win, so that was that was a rough one. Luckily, luckily I didn't have money on it, but damn. Uh, overall, this though is how I felt this game would go. Close enough to be interesting, but also never really too worried about the Cowboys' chances of winning. But this was another week where the Giants' run game would not work, and that's what everything else is built upon for this offense. The way this roster is constructed, and just like with who's healthy out there, Slayton is the only player Jones can really target downfield. Everyone else really only receives targets like almost exclusively off play action, motion, other gimmicky ways to get them open, or just like quick routes. Um, they don't run a traditional passing offense, whether that's because the receivers or maybe they just don't trust Daniel Jones to execute. But because of this, any team that really takes away the run just takes away what they want to do on offense. And that also makes it tougher on the Cowboys or the Giants defense because they really like to play this ball control, like bleed the clock, don't give their other team too many possessions. But when you're having to pass a lot more because you can't run the ball, can't execute that. I did want to shout out on their defense, though. Rookie came on Thibodeau. He had a monster game. Like, it's not going to show up in the sacks. I don't, he didn't even get one sack. But he was just constantly making like he- life hell for uh, Dak Prescott and also doing pretty good against the run. Really good game for him. And for the Cowboys, they just made some mistakes. And if they didn't, this could have been a lot uglier for the Giants. McCarthy got lucky that his fourth down decision didn't cost them a touchdown. Like, I'm all for being aggressive going for it on fourth down. But you're going to run it on fourth and two on your first drive in your own territory against a good run defense. It was really just a silly play call. Like, I 
I would have personally punted, but it wasn't like a terrible call to go for it. Like, yeah, I get it. You want to establish the tone early, but why are you going to try to run it up the middle? Um, Dak, he also had a couple picks, one which he thought was a free play, and the other, whilst under pressure, he just tried to force it into Lamb. Um, other than that, though, they really looked dominant. Their run defense was phenomenal. Um, like I know the Giants' run offense has been struggling recently, but like early on in the year, they were awesome. So I'm still kind of leaning towards their better run offense, and this was a really good performance by their defense. You know, uh, Parsons, he's continuing to make his case for Defensive Player of the Year. And then offensively, they had a really nice balance between Zeke and Pollard this game. And each receiver for them took a dominant half. Michael Gallup was making some high light real catches. I thought he was going to have like some crazy game. And then in the second half, CD Lamb was like, nah, I'm not going to be outshined. And he made some even better catches, like one-handers. Wish that touchdown catch counted, but he was obviously out of bounds. Um, they really look like a team that's ready to go on a deep playoff run, and that should scare the rest of the NFC. Then we have the Patriots at the Vikings. Patriots winning, or Vikings winning this one, sorry. 33-26, to covering and winning. And yeah, this was a great way to end Thanksgiving. Uh, starting off with the Vikings side, Justin Jefferson is just unreal. And we're going to have to say that every week because he's just going to keep doing things that blow our minds. He was getting double teamed left and right and still came down with some awesome catches through traffic. Cousins was also on fire last night. Like, yeah, he had that pick early in the game, and that was bad. No, no ifs or buts. But he recovered and played good, played really clean ball for the rest of the day and made a couple perfect throws to Jefferson. I am officially concerned with the run game, though. It's Thanksgiving, and they're averaging less than 100 yards per game as a team, and Cook has only topped 100 twice, averaging 1.9 yards per carry this game. Clearly, they can still win though through the air, but to win a Super Bowl, it's like a lot of things need to go right, and this is just one thing that can go wrong, and right now, the Vikings are a Super Bowl aspirations team, so you're going to look at them through a different light, you know, you're going to nitpick everything that's wrong with them, and I think the Vikings, if they could play perfectly, like obviously they could win a Super Bowl the way they're built right now, but... That's just one thing that, like, okay, they can't get the ground game established and they lose because they can't run the ball against a team in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And then defensively, they also need to figure out cornerback too. Peterson is great as the one. Sullivan is a solid slot option. But they've been rotating cornerback too ever since Dantzler went out. Uh, I was really hoping Andrew Booth would take that job, but he hasn't. He was benched this game. Um, Duke Shelley got the start instead, and he definitely got beat on a handful of plays. Hopefully either Shelly improves this is his first start so we could get better or maybe Andrew Booth kind of takes that corner as a rookie. Um, either way, it's definitely a weakness on the roster right now. And although the Patriots lost, at least it wasn't because of their offense. Mac Jones, he played incredibly today, doing a great job navigating the pocket, avoiding pressure, and finding his guys open downfield, hitting them right on the money. This looks like the first half rookie Mac Jones that helped lead the Patriots to a Super Bowl. The Patriots really just got out-talented defensively. Like, Belichick always does the most with lesser talent, but at some point it just comes down to Justin Jefferson is better than both Jonathan Jones and Devin McCourty combined, so he's going to beat your double team for a big gain. And if you don't have the personnel to match it, like, you don't have the personnel, there's nothing you could really do about it when you're going against Justin Jefferson. And I think the Patriots are very much alive in the playoff hunt, uh, maybe even more so like I love the way their offense looked and I'm kind of am believing in them a bit more after this game but when it comes to faces facing Patrick Mahomes Travis Kelsey in Kansas City uh, Josh Allen Stephon Diggs in Buffalo Joe Burrow Jamar Chase in Cincinnati any of these teams with like game-breaking quarterback wide receiver duos um, I don't know if they're going to be able to neutralize them the same way Belichick could back in the day all right so now we're going to get, we have a full slate of games this week. No one's on by. Uh, so we're going to start off with the Texans at the Dolphins. Dolphins are going to be 13 and a half point favorites. And so the one win Texans, they just benched their second year quarterback, Davis Mills, for Kyle Allen. I truly do not know how many more games this squad is going to win. Like, obviously, I'm picking the Dolphins in this one. There's no question about it. The only question is, is how much. Uh, 13 and a half, that is a large spread. That should always make you question. I don't like the changes of Texas or Houston putting up points on the Dolphins' defense. Like I know it's not as good as it has been in the past few years, the Dolphins' defense speaking. Um, 
but they do have talent across the board. And I really think that this defensive line is going to beat up the Texans offensive line. Kyle Allen's going to be under pressure, make some mistakes. Xavier Howard is one of the best cornerbacks at taking advantage of a quarterback's mistakes. So it really just comes down to, do I think that this historically good Dolphins offense is going to do good against this Texans defense? And unless this is a trap game to end all trap games, I don't see how the Texans have any hope. Even if they do manage to slow down Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, and this Dolphins passing attack, Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert has been incredible these past few weeks, and the Texans have one of the worst, if not the worst, run defense in the league. So I'm going to pick the Dolphins to cover and win. They wear the Ravens at the Jags. Ravens are going to be three and a half point favorites in this one. The Ravens have really flipped the script on this season. They started off as a team with great offense and a bad pass defense that would blow double-digit leads on the regular. However, they're on a four-game win streak, and it's really their defense that has stepped up with all the injuries piling up on offense. And it looks like Marcus Williams could be back this week. Um, Too early to tell, but if he does, that's just going to help this defense out even more. And then the Jags are coming off their bye after a disappointing loss to the Chiefs. They pulled out all the tricks and won the turnover battle 3-0, but still lost by 10. And I think that kind of just epitomizes the Jag season. They can compete and maybe even win some games they aren't supposed to, but at the end of the day, they are just lacking overall talent. As I said, the Ravens' defense, especially against the pass, has stepped up recently. And I think you've got to give the advantage to Marlon Humphreys and Marcus Peters over Christian Kirk and Say Jones. However, I do think that the Jags could slow down this Ravens offense enough to make this a game. Allen and Walker have been inconsistent rushing the passer, but Ronnie Stanley could definitely miss this game or at least be playing through injury, and they do have really high upside, Allen and Walker, that is. Uh, I like Tyson Campbell and the secondary's odds at slowing down Demarcus Robinson and the rest of these receivers, but over the middle, Lloyd and Alua Khan are definitely going to have their hands full covering Mark Andrews. Last week, the Ravens really struggled in the traditional run game, only really getting things going with draws and Lamar runs. And the Jags had the 10th-ranked run D, so I think they also had the advantage there. All signs are pointing to like another low-scoring game, and I feel like it's going to be kind of similar to last week's Ravens game. A close one until Lamar really turns it on and helps them pull away, so I'm going to pick the Ravens to cover and win. Then we have the Bears at the Jets, Jets six-point favorites. It looks like we're getting Mike White versus Trevor Simeon. The Bears have been exciting as a bad team these past few weeks. Uh, They've put up a lot of points and have some crazy highlight reels. But their defense has also allowed anywhere between 27 and 49 points in these last four contests. The reason why they've been so exciting is Justin Fields. And with him showing promise and then getting injured last game, I don't see how you throw him out there, especially this week. Um, So yeah, I'm just going out and assuming that we're seeing Trevor Simeon because it would just be a mistake by a Bears team who's not going to go anywhere this year to risk their franchise. And we're going to see Trevor Simeon behind this offensive line without his crazy escapability throwing to receivers who have been really inconsistent all year. And they're doing it against what may be the league's best defense in the New York Jets. But it's not all rosy for the 6-4 and four Jets. After another atrocious performance and then deflecting the blame, Second year, second overall pick, Zach Wilson, was benched in favor of Mike White. I mean, wow. Like, I know he's had some ugly performances, and Mike White might give you a better chance to beat the Bears, but I don't really think White is the answer. I feel like going against the Bears defense, this was a week for Wilson to get some of his confidence back because he has the physical tools to lead this team on a deep playoff run. And right now, if you're thinking playoffs at the, as the Jets, you're in the wrong mindset. Um, but now with... Mike White, like, I don't have that same confidence in him of his upside. Obviously, I don't have confidence in Wilson right now with what he's shown, but are we going to see Wilson start again this season? Like, this is a huge, huge deal. But just on this week, let's see what White's got. He was electric against the Bengals last year before just completely falling flat in the next few games. Uh, But maybe he's just one of these guys who comes in as a backup, has a great game, and then falls apart. Um, so he could do that here against the Bears. As I said, the Bears' defense has really been reeling, and the Jets have weapons that could go off. It just depends on if this offensive line gives White enough time, and that White doesn't do his best like Zach Wilson impression out there. I do think, though, six points is a lot for this battle of backups, so I'm going to pick the Bears to cover, but the Jets win. 
Then we have the Bengals as at the Titans, Bengals being two and a half point favorites. The Titans defense always does better than expected, playing above their talent level and making some of the league's best look vulnerable. But they aren't always great, as we saw earlier this year when they faced Buffalo. And I think a fully healthy Bengals offense would give the Titans some problems. However, they aren't fully healthy. Jamar Chase is back at practice, but no guarantees that he's going to be able to go this week. And Joe Mixon is going to miss this week after suffering a concussion last week. And their defense hasn't been the same defense that got them to the Super Bowl last year. They gave up 30 points to the Steelers last week, 21 to the Panthers, and then 32 to the Browns. They've been a middling run defense and could definitely have their hands full with Derrick Henry here. It's going to be on this Titans offense then to put up enough points for them to win. Even if Derrick Henry goes off, it is tough to point up a ton of points on the backs of a ground game alone. We saw that a couple weeks ago where Derrick Henry just went off against the Chiefs and the Texans and they scored 17 points in each of those games. However, last time we saw them, the Packers did slow down Derrick Henry, and Tannehill really stepped up, having one of his best games in a while, while finishing with over 300 yards and two touchdowns, with 100 of those yards going to rookie Traylon Burks. That connection is real, and the Titans are able to be more of a balanced offense, then this team could be scary, like playoff scary. And I think it's more likely that the Titans have figured out their passing offense, at least enough, versus the likelihood that Jamar Chase is going to be playing and fully healthy enough to really take over this game so i think the titans do end up covering and winning then we have the falcons at the commanders commanders being four and a half point favorites so like are the commanders good winning five of their last six including beating the undefeated eagles and now sitting at six and five but some are last in the nfc east it's all just so weird it feels like it shouldn't be working with taylor heineke playing really risky ball but his aggressive play style is putting his team in position to win and especially with their defense looking better, looking more like it did a few years ago. William Jackson clearly wasn't a fit here, and they've looked much better in coverage with Fuller and St. Juice on the outside. Uh, Allen and Sweat have been great rushing the passer this year, and now it looks like that they're getting number two overall pick, Chase Young, back this week, and we might finally get to see this vaunted commander's defensive line that we thought we'd see years ago. And for the Falcons, they've also surprisingly been in the playoffs hunt, five and six, and half a game out of first place in the NFC South. They've been reliant on their ground game, which feels like the only consistent part of this team. Mariota has been up and down looking good last week against the Bears after looking benchable against the Panthers the week before. And then their defense has mostly just been bad. They did get AJ Terrell back last week, and he made a few plays, definitely helped bolster up their pass defense, but they truly just lack the personnel to be a good defense. Terrell and Jared are really the only plus players they have on that side of the ball. If they win games, they're going to win in shootouts. But I feel like it would be wrong to pick against Heineke in a shootout. It's going to end as a close game. So I'm going to pick the Falcons to cover, but the Commanders still come out on top. Then we have the Broncos as one and a half point favorites at the Panthers. It sounds like Steve Wilkes listened to me last week. Um, I didn't think we'd actually see it, but we're going to see Sam Darnold make his season debut. And it will be ugly. Like, yeah. He's going to give them a better chance to win than Baker, if nothing more than just like, oh, this is a new spark. Um, but to come in and have to face the Broncos right away is just a bad draw. I just don't see how they're going to pass the ball. And Vertain could lock up more as long as Darnold doesn't make some crazy throws to get him open. And Josh Jacobs has been the only running back to find real success on the ground against this defense, so I'm not really putting my eggs in the basket of Deontay Foreman to do the same. So this one feels like it's the Broncos' one to lose. But they're going to try. I mean, this is just ridiculous how bad Russell Wilson in this offense has been. It doesn't help that they've been hit with injuries at wide receiver and offensive line. Uh, Judy will almost certainly miss this game. Barring anything crazy, this is going to be a low-scoring game that will come out to who shoots himself in the foot last. And I think there is going to be something to making a quarterback switch where the Panthers are going to get that magic spark. And I also just don't trust Russell Wilson to not be that quarterback to make the crucial mistake at the end anymore. So I'm going to pick the Panthers to cover and win. Then we have the Bucks at the Browns, Bucks being three and a half point favorites. Uh, the Bucks are coming off their bye after starting to get some momentum, winning two straight and starting to get all their weapons healthy again. They still didn't look all the way back, but they just took an extra week to iron out some of the wrinkles that they've had. And if there's any player I trust to figure out that stuff, given an extra week, it's going to be Brady. And for the Browns, I just don't trust their defense. 
the Bucks have struggled against the run all year, or struggled to run to all year, but rookie Rashad White had his first 100-yard game two weeks ago in Munich, and I'd be shocked if they weren't able to find the same success against the Browns. I like pieces in their secondary. Ward came back last week, and rookie Morton Emerson has looked great out there too, but I think the Browns are going to be able to get theirs through the air a bit and just like dominate on the ground game, like be a dominant run game and complement it with a couple passes, you know? And it just depends on if the Browns then can keep up offensively. Offense has not been their problem. Brissette has looked good and has probably played his way into being a starter next year on some team, maybe the Colts. Um, and oh, he's not going to go back to the Colts, I just realized. <laughs> I forgot he was already there. Um, on the ground, though, Chubb and Hunt are one of the best duos. But the Bucks still have one of the best defenses in the league. They've gotten their pieces back at the secondary, and while it definitely sucks that they lost Barrett, they're still able to generate some pressure with Devin White on blitzes, and first-round pick from last year, Joe tryon Shurinka has been turning it up these past few weeks. And with that, I think that's going to be enough to limit the Browns, so I'm going to pick the Bucks to cover and win. Then we have the Raiders at the Seahawks, Seahawks being three-and-a-half-point favorites, and these have been two of the most shocking teams in the league, both for opposite reasons. The Raiders have been majorly disappointing, and beating the Broncos in overtime doesn't really change how I view this team. This offense is still just the Devontae Adams show, uh, Carr barely throwing it to anyone else, and he's been pretty bad in general this year. Missing throws, not seeing guys open, being immobile in the pocket. Uh, yeah, there's His strengths from years before, his processing just isn't there, and whether it's the system or whether it's just like, this is just now who he is, we're yet to see, but yeah, it just has not looked good for the Raiders offensively. And the Seahawks have been the opposite. Geno Smith is having a complete career revival, and he's distributing the ball incredibly, getting players like Marquise Goodwin and Colby Parkinson involved, as well as the Stars. Paired with Kenneth Walker and having a rookie of the year type performance and this young offensive line improving, this has been one of the most exciting teams to watch all year. And then their defense has turned it around too. They started off horrible, but their young corner trio of Tariq Woolen, Mike Jackson, and Kobe Bryant have really taken strides. Ryan Neal is breaking out, filling in for Jamal Adams. And while I still don't love their pass rush, Uchenna and Wosu and Bruce Irvin have really provided some juice off the edge recently. Devontae Adams is likely going to get his against the secondary, but they should have a real chance of slowing down the likes of Mac Hollins and Keenan Cole. However, they're also going to need to slow down Josh Jacobs, and they do have the fifth worst run defense in the league and struggle to stop the Bucks run game the last time we saw them. This feels like a shootout type game, definitely, as the Raiders defense has been bad all year out of the last game, which was versus Russell Wilson. And with how these one-score games are going for the Raiders, I feel pretty comfortable picking the Seahawks to cover and win. Then we have the Chargers three-point favorites at the Cardinals. The Chargers look back last week. Like, yeah, they still lost. That sucks. But they look like a team who should be pushing for a playoff spot. Getting Allen back and pushing everyone down the depth chart really woke up this passing attack. Palmer looked great out there as the number two. Obviously, wish he was the number three as Mike Williams came in there, got injured, and isn't practicing still. So it looks like they're going to be without the whole core again. But I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem going against the Cardinals. Because, yeah, the Cardinals, they're just flat. We'll see if Kyler plays an odd, and if he does, I think he can definitely make it closer, but I just don't view this as a playoff team anymore. This offense is inconsistent, and it seems like teams are able to figure out what they like and do a good job of countering that. And on defense, they just don't have any players. Like, they have a couple pieces. Buda Baker is good. I love the development we're seeing from Zayvon Collins this season, and J.J. Watt still sometimes provides that spark. But overall, you aren't scared of those guys, and you definitely aren't scared about anyone else out there. I think this could really be a statement game for the Chargers that they're finally not going to charge our way this season and this is going to be the start to a win streak that leads them to the playoffs. So I'm going to pick the Chargers to cover and win. Then we have the Saints at the Niners. Niners being 9.5 point favorites. The Niners look like one of the best teams in the NFC right now and I'd be kind of shocked if we didn't see them in the NFC Championship game at this point. However, this definitely has trap game written all over it. The Niners are feeling themselves right now on a three-game win streak where they've won by an average of 17 points. McCaffrey looks like the missing piece in the Shanahan offense that he's been searching for, and Jimmy G is on one of the best runs of his career. 
defensively, Nick Bosa is playing like a defensive player of the year. They have good depth at rushing the passer too, so it's not just him. Warner and Greenlaw are a top-tier linebacker duo, and their secondary has really been playing well despite being hit by injuries. But it's not like the Saints are some pushover squad. Andy Dalton has been playing well most of the season, including a great game last week. Olave is already a star receiver. Kamara is one of the best weapons in the league. Lattimore is back at practice, so we'll see if he does end up playing. And shout out Caden Ellis, who has been amazing these past couple weeks at linebacker. Going against Jimmy G, I could definitely see him having his first career interception. However, Jordan and Davenport both both missed last game and could very much miss this week too, or at least very least not be 100%, you know. And this pass rush was pretty ugly without these two. I think the Niners are definitely the better team here, but I don't like how big the spread is. I think the Saints are going to give them a real fight, so Saints cover and Niners win. And then we have the Rams at the Chiefs, Chiefs being 15 and a half point favorites. Wow, the spread on this one, but it makes sense. The Chiefs are Super Bowl favorites. Their amazing offense led by Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, and their defense is one of the most underrated units in the league. Chris Jones, rookie uh, George Karloftis up front look really good. Their young secondary is getting healthier and coming into their own. And Bolton at linebacker is a certified star at this point. And they get to face off against Bryce Perkins and the Cupless Rams. While Perkins looked kind of decent last week against the Saints, I think part of it was just the Saints not being ready for a mobile quarterback to suddenly come in expecting Matt Stafford. Now the Chiefs are going to be ready, and they're going to put him under constant pressure, attacking that offensive line, and I think he can get really ugly really fast. So despite that big spread, I am going to pick the Chiefs to cover it and win. Then we have the Packers at the Eagles. Eagles 6.5 point favorites. The Eagles started off 8-0, but have lost to the Commanders and had to come back to beat the Colts by one last week. Their passing game has really struggled these past few weeks, at least relative to the success they were having earlier this season. It feels like they're really missing having Dallas Goddard out there in the middle, with only one target going to a tight end in last week's matchup. And despite their struggles, the Packers averaged less than 200 passing yards allowed per game. They're a bottom 10 run defense though, so the Eagles should be able to run the ball a good amount this week but don't expect the eagles to come out and look like that they've righted the ship you know and the packers finally found a receiver that can find the end zone but it didn't help too much only putting up 17 points last week and i doubt watson will have another multi-touchdown game with slay and bradbury guarding him however the packers are built to run the ball so let's see if it pays off against a lackluster eagles run defense they were able to slow down Taylor and the Colts last week with the addition of Sue and Joseph, though. So let's see if these vets really did help boost their run defense or if that was kind of just a one-week thing. Personally, I think they did boost their run defense a bit, but I think the Packers are still going to be able to run the ball a good amount, enough to keep this game interesting and cover, but I think the Eagles still do end up winning. Then we have the Steelers at the Colts. Colts, two and a half point favorites. The Colts were so close to doing the improbable and starting off the Jeff Saturday air at 2-0. and at 4-6-1, and one, they aren't dead in the playoffs yet, and they're playing like it, especially on defense. They're allowing spot-on 20 points a game, but they've been just playing like a very balanced style on defense. Like, they don't have any true game-wrecking elite players. You could you could argue Buckner is one sometimes, but everyone really just does their do- job, and, like, it doesn't feel like this is a good defense looking at who's on it, but then, yeah, they, they just, it, it just all works together, you know? And I think that could be a problem for Pickett and the Steelers. The Colts aren't going to give him anything easy. And outside of missing Shaquille Leonard, they're pretty healthy. So Pickett can't just pick on backups like he did last week against the Bengals. They have been able to run more recently. So we'll see if they can continue that success against the Colts, who do have an above average run defense. But I think they're going to need to get this ground game working in order to open up more pass for Pickett's. Or else I'm, going to, I'm worried that we're going to see way too many desperate heaves up towards George Pickens who will come down with a couple but that's not how you want to run an offense but also the Steelers aren't going to need to score too many points to beat the Colts who have just been bad on that side of the ball this year the defensive line is going to really eat the Colts alive giving Taylor nowhere to run and Ryan no time to throw I don't hate the Colts receivers going against the secondary but I also feel like the secondary is going to be able to play aggressive due to how fast this pass rush is going to get in making it much easier on the corners so I see this as a low-scoring game with one team just squeaking it out and 
Tomlin, he has that no losing record to defend. So, you know, this one, this isn't a game that the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to drop. So I'm picking the Steelers to cover and win. All right, so that's going to do it for today's episode. If you're on YouTube, let me know some of your picks. Did you like your Thanksgiving Day um, games? And what was your favorite thing that you ate on Thanksgiving? Uh, leave a like and subscribe. And if you're on Apple, Spotify, wherever you might be finding this, leave a five-star review. Go tell your friends. Help spread it out. And yeah, see you all next time.